I just want to talk a few things, and I, I think given my uh, industry background, which is sort of multifunctional really, so I've worked in, in winemaking in Australia a lot, involved in bulk production for Accolade Wines and AVL, um, so I've seen the bulk uh, wine industry from the production side. Um, I've also worked for Sainsbury Supermarket in terms of sourcing, um, and in the early days really of the industry and the big change that we saw in the UK, um, I was involved in part of a big supermarket in moving the wine into the UK. Um, and then um, I uh, had to study an MW and pick a topic, um, and I chose to, I guess, pull some of that experience together um, from having seen bulk wine moving from country of origin to, to being packed in the UK. Um, so hopefully my background gives me a few words of experience to share, um, and I hope you find some of it interesting and useful. So I'll, just, I'll do two things really quickly. So I'll talk just generally and give you some background about why, why you should ship in bulk and why people do ship in bulk. Um, you know, this is a mature uh, market in terms of bulk shipments, so a lot of us in the room know why we do it. Um, but it's just worth refreshing some of that. I think just having a discussion about what the process looks like um, and possibly also what can uh, be some of the tricky things that need to be managed. Then I'll talk you through my MW dissertation, which absorbed a lot of my time, um, and hopefully I can distill that down, I think, into a couple of little nuggets of information that I think some of you might find useful um, looking at a really specific topic. Um, so firstly, just quickly having a look at why, why, why would anybody want to put wine in a huge big container and move it halfway across the world? Um, to the, to the target market where you want to sell the wine. And there's some very, very good reasons. Firstly, um, legislation um, has been pretty, pretty firm. Um, there's a lot of penalties and incentives for companies um, to do things um, which um, reduce waste. So the National Waste Strategy, Packaging Waste Regulations, and there's a carbon reduction commitment that all businesses in the UK have signed up to, including especially the retailers um, and their commitments um, become essentially by proxy the industry's commitments. Environmentally, um, it's a bit of a no-brainer. So <clears throat> if you put a container full of wine bottles, um, you're basically getting about half the volume that you can achieve in a 24,000 liter um, flexi tank or ISO. It opens up other opportunities that are beneficial environmentally, such as um, using lighter weight glass. So you know, you can get down to as low as a 300 gram bottle um, because you don't need to have such a, a robust um, glass bottle to survive the, the journey from one place to the other. Um, you can get involved with things like using more recycled glass in the country of uh, bottling, such as the UK. Um, and overall, that can reduce the CO2 emissions by around 38%. The, the perception, I think, in the industry um, used to be certainly that bulk shipment was a bit of a, a little dirty secret of the wine industry. Um, you know, there, there was lots of negative connotations, I think, around quality. Um, I think there's been a lot changed, and hopefully I can talk about some of that in a second. But there's some really, really good reasons um, to bulk ship. Um, because you've got 24,000 litres of wine all together um, is a term that kind of chemists call thermal mass, so because the wine is all together in a big block of, of liquid really, it's difficult if there's an environmental stress such as a higher or lower temperature for that wine and that, that volume of wine to move in temperature, whereas if you've got um, a bunch of wine in bottles together then they're more exposed to, to temperature stress and change. If you can bring wine in and have it nicely tucked away in a tank in the UK, you can keep an eye on it, you can control the temperature that it's stored at, you can adjust um, things like the SO2, so you can keep an eye on that wine and keep it in really good condition before you wish to bottle it and then send it to the market. Um, this is really, really important for things like bag and box and small formats. Um, so bag and box essentially have a bit of a shelf life of say nine to 12 months. So if you put wine into a bag and box in Australia and you've lost two or three months in terms of shipping it to the UK, um, that means that you've got a much shorter length of time in which to sell a bag and box. 
um, and the same for smalls really. So you can really start to bottle on demand um, and respect the, the challenges really that bag and box or, or small formats present in terms of managing quality. Um, really, you know, as I said, packaging wise, there's some very good reasons. So, like being able to bottle close to the market, you've got less wear and tear. Um, so, bottles suffer from scuffing, from being rattled around. Bag and box will collapse. Um, the paper material will tear, um, and you'll really see, you know, quite a lot of impact of that physical movement um, of wine moving from the country of production to the country of packing. So that means that your brand. Um, that is the thing that the customer sees in the store. You don't want the customer to view your brand as the, the one with the scuffed labels or the shabby kind of bag and box that's half torn or squashed. So the presentation of your brand is obviously really, really important. Um, and bulk shipment can help you do that really better. Now this is the bit that the commercial guys get really excited about. So cost, um, again, is very, very beneficial. Um, you've got CCT savings. Um, you've got reduced shipping because you've got double the amount of volume. Um, you're able to consolidate your buying of dry goods in the UK, which is really important. Um, so your total cost savings can be roughly about 30 to 45%. Um, so again, that allows you to offer a much more attractive commercial proposition to your retail partners. Um, again, there's other kind of benefits like um, storage um, and being able to respond better um, to a promotional opportunity. Um, by having wine in a tank that you can, you can bottle quite quickly. So now we've kind of covered that. Um, this is the really exciting topic of my MW dissertation, um, which was to analyze the performance of ISO tanks versus single-use flexes as a method of transporting a bulk white wine from Australia to the UK. Now, I probably had two ambitions to the MW dissertation apart from passing. Um, so one, I really wanted to have a subject that um, if I find a difference, that was interesting. If I find no difference, that was also interesting. So it meant that whatever the outcome, I had something that was going to be vaguely interesting for somebody like you guys to kind of understand and, and know about. Um, it's obviously a very, very small part of the industry, um, but I thought it was quite an interesting topic. And given my job at the time, I had a really uh, good opportunity to do something quite interesting. The other thing I wanted to do was to do a, a topic that was maybe so boring that the markers uh, either fell asleep or gave up halfway through and just said, look, we'll, we'll, we'll pass this topic um, and, uh, and be done with them. But, um, so <clears throat> the idea for the, for the topic kind of came to me. As I saw the change in, in bulk shipment, um, the rapid, rapid increase and change in the volume and numbers of wine being shipped um, and bottled in the UK. So at the time, from just as an example, 2008 to 12, um, bulk shipment from Australia changed from 29% to 80%. Um, and as Florian said, there's more wine um, being sold now that's been bulk shipped than not, I think, was not the, the figure. Um, I would say that's you know, definitely the case for new world countries in the UK. So the two most commonly used formats that you will all um, be involved with are things called ISOs and flexi tanks. I'll explain what those are in a minute. And when I was working in winemaking in Australia, a lot of the winemakers said to me, ISOs are far, far superior to flexi tanks. Um, so I, again, that was some of the things I thought, well, you know, that would be quite interesting if I could either um, understand that, um, whether that was correct or not. I thought at least that would be quite an interesting topic. So just quickly, I'm sure hopefully all of you have seen what an ISO and a flexi tank look like, but this is what they are and what they look like. So on the left is an ISO, which is really um, a big steel tank effectively on its, on its side. Um, and the flexi tank, um, as the name suggests, is a flexible tank. Um, so it is really like a massive big bag and box. So it's a huge big bag in a standard dry van, isn't that the, my Hillebrand friends are here, uh, term. Um, that's, that's what they sit in. So that's kind of the spec, but they both contain somewhere between 24, um, ISOs can go up to 26,000 litres. Um, they're both not only used in the wine industry, they're used to move whiskey, they're used to move milk, um, they're used in lots of different industries, both hazardous and non-hazardous, um, to move uh, things and liquids around the world. Um, so just 
again, a little bit of background. I think this is always quite interesting. It's easier to explain things by pictures, so I took some, I took some photos. Um, so this is the bulk process quickly from, from kind of start to finish. Um, I didn't even do this on purpose, but the pictures from Australia are really sunny, and the pictures from the UK are really depressing and grey. Um, so this is the wine, and you can see from the sun being loaded in Australia. Um, there's lots of complicated looking filtration equipment, um, and the bulk industry has moved now to wine is really treated um, as if it is about to be bottled um, just prior to being loaded. Um, so the standards are all very, very similar, um, and the level of equipment and gear most dedicated uh, wineries have um, a dedicated area in their winery for uh, loading bulk shipment. It's taken that seriously um, by many big companies. So that's what one looks like loading a flexi tank. In this picture, the, the bag hasn't quite been filled yet. If, if it was, you would see it kind of popping over that rail um, at the top. So there's lots of nice big toys available to move things around. Um, so you can see what a, what a container looks like, um, whether it's been loaded from the winery, um, moved um, down to the docks um, before um, it's put on a ship. This is what these massive um, ships look like. If you're standing looking up at one, it looks like an absolute huge skyscraper. These, these ships are enormous. Um, so I've got a, I'll show you in a second, but there's there's different options you can see in the, on that ship, whether your container lands up being on the top of the ship, in the middle of the ship, near the engine. Um, there's lots of different um, implications in terms of managing wine quality because of where your box ends up. Um, some of the ships can be single or double hull, and depending on the size, they can be more or less exposed to water temperature. So obviously, if you're going through warmer, hotter water, um, and you've got a single hull ship, you may get more temperature fluctuation. Um, so that's a consideration. The machinery in the engine um, obviously has some heat noise and sometimes uh, aromas coming out of it. Um, so again, being, being near the engine can be important. Being on the deck, you're obviously exposed to um, temperature um, and even sometimes the containers fly off and end up in the sea somewhere. Um, so this is what the journey looks like from Australia. So you, you can see you're obviously going through the equator, um, which is often quite a warm place. One of the interesting things I, I found out doing this was that um, because the ships over time have been getting bigger, um, the shipping time has become longer and longer um, because of the size of the ships. So they become much more consolidated, much more efficient. So the length of time that your wine spends on a boat um, has actually over time got longer. The, the wine will make a, a pit stop somewhere completely unpronounceable. Is anybody from Hildebrand in here, isn't it? Jung Jung Palapas, is that the place? Is that what it's called? Yes? No, I don't know. I think it's something like that. But So the wine ends up stopping somewhere uh, often just through the equator um, in a place that you, you can't really pronounce. And it's often quite a hot place. Um, so wine can sit on the, on the dock side for a period of time. And again, um, there's implications for temperature um, exposure. So there's lots of different wine quality, I call them sort of wine quality stressors going on during this process, um, whether you're um, sitting at port um, and exposed or not. So it's the same the other side, the wine gets offloaded again. And this is the depressing gray picture in the UK uh, when it's arrived um, in, this, in the rain and uh, cold, um, and it's really offloaded um, in the reverse of the process that we just looked at. So just quite briefly, what, you know, what can possibly go wrong? So there are a few hazards uh, of doing this. Um, oxidation uh, was one of the concerns that's often talked about uh, doing bulk shipment. Um, you've got the temperature fluctuations that I've talked about. Microbial spoilage can come either from um, poor filtration or inherently um, in the wine before you start, which isn't, which isn't a good starting place. You can get cross-contamination, especially with ISOs. Um, these are multi-use containers, so they're used many, many times for different um, industries. Flexi tanks are single-use, so you could argue there's less opportunity for cross-contamination there. 
humidity is often uh, quite a big stressor when it comes to flexi tanks. Um, and you've got things like taints. There's been a few notable um, issues with uh, bulk shipment and taints over the years. Um, you've got things like tampering. So, you know, can anybody um, get into the wine and cause um, a thing called a biohazard? So, bioterrorism is, is quite a big concern. Um, and then there's leaking, which is obviously a real pain in the butt if your uh, tanker is leaking and it has, to, it has to get shipped back to where it came from. So in my MW dissertation, um, there was a three-part methodology. So the first phase, I did a questionnaire. I really wanted to just canvas the Australian winemakers and see what they thought about bulk shipment and just get their opinion and, and see what they considered to be the issues. The second phase was really doing the actual practical bit, which I put um, some wine in, both ISOs and flexi tanks, and I wanted to compare them um, at the other end um, once they were bottled. Um, and then the third phase was doing a blind wine tasting where I took the two uh, sets of samples and we tasted them um, in quite a big group um, to see if there was any qualitative difference between the, the two shipping formats. So the, the first phase questionnaire, and this, this shows how I consolidated the Australian wine industry in terms of bulk shipping, is I, I interviewed seven winemakers that represented 99 point something percent of the, of the market. Um, so the seven guys really doing most of uh, the bulk shipment from Australia. Um, so I just wanted to understand what their opinions were and what their experience um, had been of handling ISOs and flexi tanks. Um, and I wanted to understand the prevailing technical preference for either one or the other. Um, and I wanted to also see what they thought about the specific pros and cons um, in respect of wine quality. Um, and I wanted to try and see if there was any frequency around the technical issues. The second phase, so this is really the process of what happened. So I picked um, wine up from Australia in Berry, um, thanks to the support of Accolade and Richard Lloyd had many conversations with me about uh, moving these wines around. But, um, so we grabbed four, four wines in each container from Berry, moved them on a big ship all the way over um, to the UK and they were bottled um, at A Park um, in 2013. Um, I looked at um, chemical analysis either end um, and I took a bunch of randomized uh, samples during the bottling event, as we call it, um, for a comparison later. And then I did a blind wine tasting. Um, I think this was probably the, the, the sneakiest thing I did for the, for the whole dissertation. I uh, hired a room in a pub opposite the decanter wine judging uh, and I offered everybody a beer um, if they would come and taste my samples. Um, at the end of uh, a day's judging, I knew that most people would be quite keen on a beer. Um, so I got 70 uh, people to assess the wine, I think 40 MWs. So 70 of the best tasters in the world came and kindly tasted this uh, little Chardonnay from Australia, but um, I was very thankful to them, but it gave me a great weight of uh, credibility in terms of um, the people tasting that wine. So we, you know, I, I, I wanted them to look at things like aroma and freshness to see um, if there was going to be a difference where that difference came from, um, if it was around things like freshness or aroma, or um, just to try and get a different, uh, an understanding of what, what the difference um, was coming from. So just quickly, this is the result of the questionnaire, which um, I thought was really, really interesting. Now, these are really clever diagrams that I was quite excited to discover, but I'll break it down on what you can, what you can get from them. So this is called a spider chart, um, and zero was low risk and five is high risk. Um, and there's all the possible problems that I outlined at the beginning. So essentially, if something's a five, that winemaker considered um, that to be a risky element of that format. So what you can see is on, on this one, if we take this one as an example, this was one of the winemakers responding. So he thought overall um, that a uh, flexi bag, uh, flexi tank was much more risky compared to the ISO overall. Um, and he gave them different scores. If you go to respondent two, he, again, we see some very different opinions. He thought essentially both of them were really low risk um, and there wasn't, there wasn't that much issue involved with either ISOs or flexi tanks. Next guy, again, thought that um, the flexi tank was much more risky for taint and oxidation. Um, this guy actually thought the reverse, 
that ISOs were way more risky um, for oxidation and transit, um, and that flexi tanks weren't that risky at all. The next, and I say guy because they were all guys. I'm, I'm not. Um, uh, I didn't have any female winemaker respondents, but um, so this winemaker thought that um, yeah, that, that flexi tanks were very risky on all parameters, and that um, the ISOs weren't risky at all. And then this winemaker again thought there was issues with both, um, but on the on the whole, um, flexi tanks were more risky. Um, same here. Um, and if I kind of averaged all of the results out overall, flexi tanks were considered to be much more risky in all, on all areas um, of, um, of, of the risk with quality. But so what, what that told me was the majority of these winemakers had a huge bias for ISOs. Um, but what was really, really interesting in terms of the different issues and why they had that bias, I, I called it there was no cohesion of concern. So there was no, the winemakers all didn't call out one issue being the, being the reason for their uh, prevailing bias for ISO. So that definitely told me that there was a real lack of understanding of the specific issues, um, but there was an overall sentiment that, um, that uh, ISOs were better. Interrogating them, what some of them did was use, because of that bias, they would use flexi tanks for their uh, bulk or their entry level. Uh, range, but when it came to moving more premium wines, they would use ISOs in preference to flexis. Um, but however, when I looked at the numbers, 85% of all Australian wine is shipped in flexi tanks, indicating that there is a very clear, pragmatic preference um, for flexi tanks, despite the, the quality concerns. So I thought that was a really interesting result. Um, Again, I find a few clever ways to communicate this, but the more times that a thing was mentioned, the bigger the word is in, in, in this kind of result summary. So the advantages for ISOs from the winemakers, they thought they could manage um, O2 management better, they thought it was an operational advantage, and they thought they were cleaner, um, and there was a, you know, a bit of a preference for wine quality. If you look at the disadvantages of um, ISOs, so the more expensive cross-contamination was, generally speaking, the biggest concern that did come out, as I say, even though there was no real cohesion of concerns. Um, and operationally, um, also a downside. Oxidation, interestingly, was quoted quite strongly as a, as a disadvantage with ISOs also. If we looked at the advantages of flexi tanks, so the big things that come out are operational and, and availability, and the cost effectiveness um, are, the, are the key drivers for using um, flexi tanks. And again, if you look at the, you know, that prevailing prejudice against flexi tanks was the oxidation was the, was the issue uh, for those winemakers that I interviewed. I talked to the winemakers really about their actual experiences involved and, and I think what you can see there of all the issues that we looked at, there's a reasonable spread um, of different issues. There was no singular issue that they had um, experience more than, more than others. Um, bearing in mind that 85% of containers are moved in flexi tanks, what I would have loved to have done is had an understanding of how many issues per 100,000 containers. So if I knew, for example, that leaking happened you know, on five trips every 100,000, so if I was able to give a relative understanding to the issue with the volume and number, I think that would be a really that would be a much more interesting um, figure, I think, than just the actual issues. Um, in terms of the actual chemical analysis, I looked at things, um, I kind of called them quality indicators. Um, so free sulfur, dissolved oxygen. Um, I wanted to look at the temperature, both um, external in the container and internal in the wine. I analyzed the wines for different taints. Um, and then I looked at some qualitative compound indicators. So some of the uh, volatile uh, fatty acids I looked at that, that can be a strong marker for um, a Chardonnay wine. So in terms of the actual chemical analysis, there was no difference between the two formats in terms of the free sulfur, which is a really strong indicator of, of what's happening in terms of oxidation. Same again for the dissolved oxygen. I didn't find any taints in either format. Um, I did, however, find significantly more volatile fatty acids in the ISO uh, samples, 
um, once they arrived in the UK versus the, uh, versus the flexi tank. So again, the, this, this chart comes from I put temperature probes were placed um, inside the container on the case of the ISO outside. And what this taught me was that this is a really shitty way to, uh, excuse my French, to look at temperature um, because uh, the external temperature was yo-yoing up and down so much that I don't think it's irrelevant. Uh, it, it didn't tell me anything that was relevant to what was uh, going on in terms of the temperature stress to the wine. The, the temperature marker I did find fantastically useful was the probe that was inside the wine that because wine in a big 24,000 litre container is always moving, um, it naturally suspends this little probe in the wine and you get a really accurate reading of what's happening with the temperature. And you can see in terms of the uh, correlation between, um, I actually lost two of the probes in transit somewhere. Um, I'm not, not sure where they went, but um, because the correlation between the probes was so narrow, um, I think that actually they gave a very, very reflective indication around what was happening with temperature in the two formats. And what I think we found was the blue line is the ISO and the red line is the flexi tank. Um, and you can see that essentially that the temperature in the wine contained within the flexi tank format um, was, was higher than the one in the ISO. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because ISO was a big thick chunk of metal um, and I think that has a lot more thermal protection than, um, than a flexi tank. So that was a, that was a really, um, I think, a really, really good result. Um, and I think the number I got was um, the flexi tank spent about 50% of their time over uh, 25 degrees um, versus the ISO that always stay well, well below that number. So the third phase and the results from the blind tasting were brilliant. I had one um, uh, Bob, a, a guy from New Zealand who was an MW. So what I did was I had all the, the samples of ISO and the flexi tank. They were all randomized samples and I had them all lined up um, in, a, in a completely random sequence so there was no bias um, such as tasting flexi tanks first and then ISO second. They were all mixed in a bunch of samples and as I had 70 uh, you know, decanter level judges, 40 MWs taste these wines and Bob tasted the samples. Uh, within about five minutes, he just chucked me back the form and said there's no difference between any of these and walked out the door. Um, and that was essentially the result that I found was there was no difference around any of the, around any of the parameters that I looked at for, the, for both formats. Um, so essentially what I think um, is that even though there was maybe more temperature stress with the, uh, with the flexi tanks, in terms of the bottling event, there are many, many other things happening um, in the A to Z of a wine moving from Australia to the UK. Um, so the actual consumer experience was no different um, for either format. So in, in terms of kind of conclusions, um, there's definitely an industry uh, perception that, that ISOs are better. And I think a lot of that is really driven because an ISO looks the same as a wine tank to many winemakers. They know the material, they know how it works, they know how to manage it. So I think there's a cultural likability from winemakers towards um, ISOs. But I think the lack of cohesion of concern indicates that you know, there's definitely a greater level of understanding that needs to be done um, to, to, to figure out uh, what the issues are and how often they happen. There was definitely more heat stress going on uh, with the flexi tank, but I definitely didn't find that that resulted in a significant difference um, in the wines, and some of the evidence supported that around the higher levels of fatty acids um, in the ISOs. The other really important conclusion I think I, I, I managed to uncover was um, that the prevailing prejudice from the winemakers was around oxidation between flexi tanks and ISOs, and I think oxidation isn't the issue at all. Um, I think the flexi uh, tank um, industry um, have made a lot of uh, improvements in terms of the material. Um, so I think actually oxidation in the round um, isn't the reason why there may be a prejudice. Um, I do think if I, you know, I would maybe challenge the flexi tank industry to look at temperature protection um, and how we can do more in terms of protecting the wine 
from temperature movement uh, during the uh, during the trip. Um, and I think what what was very clear as well is that flexi tanks have become the industry um, format of choice for very very pragmatic reasons um, around uh, availability. Um, health and safety was a huge thing from the Australians because nobody has to go up the top of an ISO tank um, to lift a, a door. Um, everything can be uh, loaded from the bottom. So health and safety has actually really driven many, many companies. One, one company said that they had no choice but to use Flexi's just on a health and safety point of view. So that was, I think that was really interesting. Um, but as I say, I would be a huge supporter of, uh, of the Flexi tanks in terms of protecting from oxidation, I think. Um, there has been some huge improvements, and I think that prejudice is maybe uh, 15 years old. Um, that uh, that flexi tanks um, gave a, a less kind of quality um, result um, than ISOs. But I think there's definitely a need for a bit more uh, research and understanding. I was obviously just looking at uh, Chardonnay, so it's a semi-aromatic wine. Um, I would love to do some more work on this with um, with more aromatic. Um, the aromas and wines are often the more fragile um, aspect, especially from, from heat. Um, so I'd love to be able to do uh, a bit more work and see a different range of quality and, and style uh, of wines in this sort of study um, and look at different quality um, of wines as well. But that's, as I say, in a nutshell, six months of my life um, that I've distilled down hopefully to a couple of nuggets of uh, semi-useful industry uh, um, uh, knowledge um, but yeah there, there you go um, but thank you for your time and that's the first time I've, I've presented it to anyone so yeah <laughs>